Good evening, everyone. Let's all rise as we begin our service with singing. Let's all rise if you are able. Sinners, Jesus will receive sound this word of grace to all who the head. Let's, get, let's bow our heads and get ready for a word of prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening where uh, we could just uh, come before you to, uh, to just worship you, to thank you, to praise you, uh, to make you our uh, only one goal tonight, Lord. And Lord, we pray that um, we'll be dependent on you, Lord, to, to look to you as, as the songs we've been singing, Lord, to, to be ready for your coming. And Lord, we... Uh, pray that you will uh, bless this evening service, and in Christ's name we pray, amen. And, uh, uh, let's uh, have some uh, welcoming remarks. Thank you, please take your seats. Good evening to all of you. I was in the, uh, the building, uh, the school building, uh, a little earlier, and I can hear that you folks had a a uh, great time with the Bible quiz. I see that you, you tire out uh, Sister Emmer, you know, make her go home. I don't tell you, you may sit down. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, as you can see, um, you know, Pastor Hernes is not uh, here with us. He is with our folks in um, Silicon Valley Outreach. I believe uh, tonight they have a special uh, service 
uh, over there in our outreach um, that includes the uh, renewal of vows for uh, Preacher Mike and Sister Stella. So that's the reason why Pastor is there tonight. And uh, please uh, continue to pray for um, our ministry. Uh, the Lord bless us with four souls this week. Uh, as far as uh, professions of faith, two last Tuesday and two yesterday. And I noticed that, you know, uh, we had a visitor sometime tonight, a couple together with uh, their daughter. Or, yeah, and uh, I guess they left already, huh? They were inquiring about um, our facility, and I guess they were met by Pastor Francis and our soul winners yesterday. Praise God for that, uh, that they're able to um, arrive here at our facility. And let's hope that uh, one of these days they will co come by and, and stay uh, during the service uh, for good as well. And uh, please uh, be reminded about the uh, special meeting that, that Pastor um, uh, is trying to call for this coming Wednesday, um, calling the attention of all our preachers and um, all our mission pastors, a special meeting that Pastor is calling before uh, his departure to the Philippines. Uh, in less than um, three weeks, okay? So other than that, that's all the announcements that, that I have for you tonight. Let's all stand, please, as I call Preacher John Paul as he leads us in our uh, welcoming song tonight. Let's all rise. Let's sing our welcoming song, People to People.
And now we're going to have a special number by our wonderful preachers, the Estegoy brothers, Preacher Abraham. and uh, Oh, uh, please be seated first and foremost. I'm sorry, everybody. And uh, let's call the Preacher Abraham and Preacher John Paul, please. The song we're going to be singing is What a Day That Will Be. special number. Now we're going to go to our offertory, and uh, as they call two ushers, I'd like to ask uh, Brother Antonio to lead us in a word of prayer, please. And uh, everybody, please stand.
with this increase, I honor you, my loving Father, thank you for the things you do, the love you show, your grace and your mercy too. Call Pastor Julius. Oh, oh Bible, our Bible pledge. Sorry, everybody. Um, uh, let's uh, get ready for our Bible pledge. Okay, uh, this is my Bible. It is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It tells me who I am, what I can become, and where I am going. It renews my mind, changes my heart, and refreshes my soul. It is my daily bread. By faith, I'll believe its promises, obey its commandments, and honor its principles in my life. With the Bible as my guide, I will walk by faith and not by sight. And uh, everybody, please be seated as I call uh, Pastor Julius. Hi, good evening to all of you. I, I, was, I was scanning uh, in the room tonight, auditorium. Uh, I don't see our speaker uh, this evening, so... I'll go ahead and ask you to please stand with me, and please open your Bibles, please, to the book of Matthew, chapter 23. Okay, since uh, there's no school tomorrow, I plan to keep you till one o'clock this morning. Okay, Matthew, chapter 23, please, and open your Bibles to verses uh, uh, 1 to 7. Okay. Beginning at verse 1, Matthew chapter 23, we'll read this responsibly. Then spake Jesus to the multitudes and to his disciples. Verse 2. Saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. And greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Okay, verse 8, one more verse. But be that called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all your brethren. Let's pray. Gracious and loving Father, Lord, tonight we are so thankful, Lord, that we can meet, Lord, for our evening service, O oh God. Lord, we pray that you will, Father, Lord, uh, guide us and direct us uh, just, Lord, how you have directed, Lord, our morning service today. Father, Lord, even though, Lord, we are few in numbers, help us, Father, Lord, to continue, Lord, to find our excitement in thee. And, uh, Father, Lord, we remember uh, all our outreaches that are also meeting tonight that the blessing that you are uh, entrusting, Lord, to us here in the Mother Church uh, will also be, Lord, done in these places, O oh God. And thank you also for the traveling mercies that you have given our, our pastor, Lord, as they head, Lord, to Silicon Valley tonight, Lord. And tonight, Lord, as we meet here in Ma our Mother Church, Lord, open, Lord, our hearts and our minds to the message, Father, Lord, that you intended, Lord, for us to listen tonight. And we ask all these things, Lord, in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, and please take your seats. Tonight, I want to um, uh, share to you a message that uh, the Lord has uh, impressed upon my heart for about uh, three weeks now, slowly uh, preparing and uh, um, putting this uh, message together in Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 to 7. 
And I want to entitle this message tonight that I'm sharing with you. To be first, we need to be last. To be first, we need to be last. And um, very clearly here in Matthew chapter 23, uh, we can find here uh, not necessarily a, a dialogue that was taking place uh, between the Lord Jesus Christ and the religious leaders, but uh, an occasion for the Lord Jesus Christ to uh, be able to bring some kind of rebuke and to be able to bring some kind of uh, challenge to, uh, among uh, those uh, who listen to him. And uh, I, I believe uh, with all my heart, as God's people tonight, that uh, you have probably also realized this by now, that for some time now, as Christians, uh, we noticed that the road that we uh, seem to uh, have been traveling uh, is getting uh, to be more difficult to, to navigate. I, I remember when I was first a, a, a very young believer, uh, way back in the early 1990s, I, I can see that there are things that, um, that um, are now in place uh, that necessarily was not uh, uh, in force or in place um, as a young believer, most especially the, uh, the attacks and the limitations and restrictions uh, that are placed upon us as believers in Christ. You know, just like, uh, for instance, uh, you know, in the uh, post-modern America, uh, here in the, this country that we live, uh, pretty much the, this society and this country that we live in, uh, even though we know that this country is built on biblical foundations, we notice that um, uh, our country is slowly getting to a point where it's tolerant, okay? Or um, what do you call that? Um, uh, of all things, um, except those things that uh, expressing their beliefs in Christ. I Meaning to say that our country is pretty much open to all those uh, absurd uh, teachings that um, you may come across and you may hear every now and then. In fact, uh, this is probably the third time that uh, you will hear this, but uh, I remember the last time that Pastor Mario Octo was here last Sunday and also uh, Pastor... Um, um, uh, Bobby Abella, when he, did, he taught during our Sunday school, uh, he, he asked us to read um, this verse. And I want you to turn to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3. And basically, I want you to read the first three verses with me, where it says, just to prove a point, that we indeed uh, live in, the, uh, in a perilous times, very dangerous times um, not, uh, right now. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, verses 1 to 3, the Bible says, This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Okay? For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those things that are good. And I can go on up to about verse 7, but for the sake of time, we will only read up to verse 3. And you can see here that one of the uh, uh, telltale signs that we are in the last days, one of the, the coming uh, uh, time of the, uh, the last days, of course, the last days um, began uh, during the insertion of the Lord Jesus Christ here on earth as a man when he was born in a manger. That, that's when the last days began. And then the Bible says, you know, it will carry on and... One of the marks of the last days that uh, we have is that there will be apostasy. Okay? That is the, uh, the turning away from, from the truth, uh, running away from the, the absolute truth of the word of God. And then uh, another thing that uh, I wanted to point out to you, you notice there in verse 2, how the Bible said, the Bible said that there will be one of the, uh, the content uh, and happenings that will be taking place when these last days uh, come is that there will be men who will be considered lovers of themselves. You know, not only that the Bible says that they will be lovers of themselves, but the Bible says that they will be proud, they will be boasters, they will be covetous, traitors, high-minded, heavy, uh, high -minded, and so on and so forth. And what I want to, um, to, um, to, to share with you this evening is, um, is the, the folly uh, that, that men may find themselves in, uh, caught, caught in, 
every now and then. And it is the, the folly of being uh, caught into the uh, status uh, trap. What I'm trying to say is, uh, there have been times in our Christian life when some Christians may have a tendency when we begin to focus on how much we have accomplished and what we have acquired in life rather than what God has done for us. You see, I believe, I believe if there's anything that God would want us to focus tonight from each and every one of us, may it be from these young men that we have here to my left, to about the middle age and the young adults that we have here and even to those uh, adults that we have here in our auditorium, no matter how, how few we are tonight, is I want us to remember that if we begin to focus on those things that we have accomplished and what we have acquired in life, okay, rather than what God has done for us, the, the danger of that is that there is a danger for us that we will lose sight of the very thing that, God, that, that really gives us um, real worth. So if you ask yourself this evening, you know, you know, you know, Pastor, what is it that in, in this life that gives me real worth? Okay? And the answer to your question tonight, you know, God's people, what gives a person real worth tonight is not what you have accomplished as a person. It is not what you have attained as a person. It is not what it's not on how many toys you have, you know, at home. Okay? But rather, um, our our status tonight is constitute or is made out of or of our uh, relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and also what how what we have done with the opportunity that the Lord Jesus Christ had entrusted us in this life. So, you know, maybe from from the world standards you will consider yourself as a failure, not somebody who is successful. But in the in the very eyes of God, you know, you are somebody that that um, brings a smile to our loving God in heaven. Somebody that, that, um, that blesses him. Somebody that blesses his heart because of how you have uh, simply entrusted uh, and given your life to him. You see, do you, know, do you know of people that I'm referring to where their, their base of self-worth is based on what they have accomplished and what they have acquired? You see, they see themselves as superior they see themselves as better than others, and what they do is because they, this is how they view themselves, they view themselves as superior, better than others, so what they do is they try to isolate themselves from those that are not to their level. They try to, they try to um, uh, keep themselves away because uh, I wish I could be wrong for this person to be thinking that uh, he or she is not better than, than anybody, you see? You see, um, they refuse to do, to do tasks that they consider menial and beneath them. You know, that's also another identification of those people uh, who can be seeking status. You know, they, they wouldn't do anything that are menial. You know, they said, oh, pastor, you know, that's below my pay grade. That's below my, you know, my ability. I wouldn't do that. You know, that's going to bring down my morale. You know, but my beloved, you know, if anything, there's an example that the Lord Jesus Christ wants us to to, to follow is the example that, that he had shown us in, in Philippians chapter 2 where he said that he humbled himself, you know, and, and like a servant. And that is actually the, the, the example that the Lord Jesus Christ wants, uh, wants us to follow, especially coming from those, his children. You see, there is a distressing attitude that is common in our society that is destroying families, that is destroying communities, and even churches. And you say, well, Pastor, what is that? What is that? Uh, 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 that that uh, uh, distracting uh, attitude that you're talking about. Okay, it is actually a um, a, uh, a term that um, I came across. You know, one time when I was reading it, and it is the term is is called is the status situs. You know what a status situs is? Like when somebody gets offended, you call them offenditis. Okay, a status is when it is an attitude that comes out and even controls us whenever, uh, whenever we desire a place of prominence. And you know, I was trying to look. I was trying to look this entire week whether there is such word, and there is. And and again, like like I say to you, and I read to you, the the layman's term is 
Statusitis is the attitude that comes out and even controls us whenever we desire a place of prominence. Especially when, when the cause uh, that it would take for us to desire prominence would entail uh, thinking that uh, this is far more important than our relationship with God and our relationship with others. You know, a lot of people, you know, they would pray. You know, they would pray, P-R-E-Y. They would pray on the, uh, at the expense of others just for them to be able to get, to get what they want. And I trust that as God's people, you know, we will be watchful of that destructive uh, attitude. You know, when we were longing to be viewed as someone of position can be a deadly trap if we are not very careful. And now, you know, we have many uh, preachers here in our church. And, you know, we should not uh, probably just look at the, uh, the title and, and the glory of becoming a preacher. But we must also look into, look past the title. Look past the glory of becoming a preacher. Look past the, the respect that, that is commanded becoming a preacher, becoming a servant of God, becoming a pastor. But as God's people being called into the ministry, there is also a price. There is also a sacrifice. There is also a cross that we must carry in order to be able to fulfill that calling God has given to us. Amen? You see, brethren, seeking recognition and standing was also a concern in the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, brethren, uh, in, in many communities, in many places, churches, even in families, okay, um, seeking recognition and standing was a concern, just like what we read about in Matthew chapter 23 tonight in those seven verses. And in fact, in those seven verses, if you're careful as we read them tonight, you will notice there the, how the Lord Jesus Christ denounced okay, this destructive attitude of seeking prominence. You see, how the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, nip, you know, the bud. How the Lord Jesus Christ discouraged us from having that attitude, okay, of trying to, you know, elevate ourselves, trying to exalt ourselves, okay. And, in fact, the Lord Jesus Christ, what he did was, he confronted the religious leaders of his day. To the point that, uh, if you will go back to our text in Matthew chapter 23, there are at least here three different occasions in Matthew chapter 23 where, where, where he said to the Pharisees, to the religious, religious leaders, but woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. You know, he, 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 he tried to, um, you know, um, denounce, you know, their, their behavior that was not living up to what was expected of them. And you can see, in other words, what the Lord Jesus Christ said to the religious leaders is that you could tell by their actions, by their words, by their, their clothing, and also their demands, that these religious leaders okay, did everything for recognition uh, and power. See, that was the motivation. That was what was behind um, these religious leaders. The very reason why they did that. The very reason why they prayed at the corner. The very reason why they, they offered these sacrifices. The very reason why they ap appeared so pious before men. Because they had something else going for them. They had a, a, a different uh, agenda. They have a different intention. They have a different intent with regards to why they did that. And we can see here, what was their, what was their motivation why they did that? They did it in order to gain recognition. They did it in order to establish their position in the society. You know, to, to gain more grounds. To be able to, to get... Uh, uh, Grab hold of that power. But my beloved, the mistake that they made is that they did those things for recognition and for power and not necessarily to honor God or to lead others to faith in Him. You see, God's people, when every time we do anything for God, whether it is in the area of music, whether it's in the area of sports, whether it's in the area of evangelism, whether it's in the area of soul winning, whether it's in the area of discipleship, whether it's in the area of Christian counseling, whether it's in the area of Christian education, it must be pointed always towards the, the sole purpose of 
Give, bringing glory to the Lord Jesus Christ or to God and leading others to faith in Him. Amen? That must be the end result that we must be praying for. The very reason why I'm doing this because I want to bless God and I want others to be blessed by what I'm doing for our God and for the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is so disappointing in Matthew chapter 23 is we can see that these religious leaders when they meet people in the street, they insisted on being treated like royalty. But my beloved, that is not the way. Uh, royalty is not the way to the heart of our Savior. Royalty is not the way to the heart of our God. You see? Uh, in fact, uh, when they attended a feast or festival, they always expected, as we read in Matthew chapter 23, they always expected to be seated at the head of the table with no questions being asked. My beloved, when we seek prominence, when there comes a time in our life when we become proud, I want to let you know, God's people tonight, that the Lord Jesus Christ, as we see in Matthew chapter 23, He condemned these actions. He condemned. The Lord Jesus Christ, you know, condemns a proud look. The Lord Jesus Christ condemns somebody who is full of pride. He condemns somebody who is arrogant, you know. And we can see that in in the, in, the, in the statement of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 23. Three times, as I said earlier. Uh, the first one in Matthew chapter 23, verse 13. He said, but who are unto you, scribes and Pharisees? And then he even paused and then said, hypocrites. And then in Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. If you will please go uh, jump 16 verses later. In the same chapter, verse 23, he said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Then it says here, For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have, pay attention, omitted the weightier matters of the law. You see, they were trying to point people to the law. But they were not actually doing what the law called for. And the Lord Jesus Christ, they cannot argue with the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ said, you know, you're trying to point people to the law, but you have omitted, you have removed, you have taken away the weightier matters, matters of the law. And what was that? Judgment, mercy, and faith. Christ said, these ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. You see, they were very legalistic. They were, they were, so, they were so into the books, but the, their actions never reflected the life that they were trying to communicate to the people. You know, it is so un unfortunate, God's people, that these prominent officials, they no longer serve the Lord, but they pursued their own selfish interests because of pride. See, they had a special agenda amongst them. You know, and my beloved, how does God call pride? God calls pride as sin. Amen? I want you to please turn your Bibles to the book of uh, Proverbs, please. And chapter 6. It says in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16, These things, these six things that the Lord hate, it says here, Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Now verse, verse 17, it says, A proud look, a lying tongue, a hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Then it says in verse 20, My son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. So you can see here, my beloved Christians, that, that God has a special uh, uh, term for that, that action, and it's a sin. And you know, my beloved, if you remember also a verse in, in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. The Bible says in 
Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And then he went on and finished up the verse, who can know it? You see in verse 9 of Jeremiah chapter 17, uh, it, is so, it is so true how our neighbors may not be able to see our heart. Amen? They cannot be able to see what's inside our heart this evening. Okay? But God can. You see? And if there's one thing that, that I want to say about our heart this evening, it's not only that the heart is the seat of our emotion, but our heart is man's innermost being. When we say that this is, this is the, uh, this is the uh, uh, man's innermost being, whatever is going on here in, in our heart, okay, that is what's going to be produced in our actions and even in our speech. And you can see here as God's people, the best of man's natural disposition apart from God's salvation and redeeming grace is described as deceitful. So unless there's going to be a salvation that, take, that will take place and unless there will be a renewing of one's heart that will take place, which will happen during one's salvation, I want to remind each and every one of us that the Bible says that um, this heart that we have, unless it is sa we get saved, it will always remain deceitful or crooked. It will always remain desperately wicked or incurably sick. That's what the Bible says. That's why what did, what did um, the prophet um, um, uh, Ecclesiastes uh, tell, told us when, uh, not the Ecclesiastes, but uh, the Bible tells us in the Old Testament when it says that God will give us a new heart the very moment that we get saved. And you can see here, my beloved Christians, this is the reason why man cannot trust his own heart. But we must leave all to God who alone know the heart and judges all men fairly. See, God knows our heart very well. And he's the one who's going to judge us fairly, better than any of us will ever know ourselves. But only one person with a redeemed heart can live in a, per, in a proper relationship with God. You know, I want to uh, point you to another place in 1 John chapter 3, verses 18 to 24. This is a place where we can see that only a person with a redeemed heart can live in a proper relation, relationship and fellowship with God. 1 John chapter 3, verses 18 to 24. Okay. See, before we get saved, we are totally depraved. And we cannot be able to, to properly function the way we ought to because we are spiritually dead. We are void of the Spirit of God. But the very moment that God... God the Spirit becomes part of our life. The indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit takes place during the moment of our salvation. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, verses 18 to 24, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And then it says in verse 19, And hereby we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before Him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. And this is the commandment that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave us commandment. And he that keepeth His commandments dwelleth in Him, and he in him, and hereby we know that he abided in us by the spirit which he had given us. So one of the, the signs that we know that we are saved is not only because of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, but it's the fact that we abide in Christ. Okay? And you know, um, a, a heart that is not changed, a heart that is not renewed, will not be able to fully abide with Christ. You believe that? You know, no matter how much you, 
You try to give them Bible even 100 times. No matter how many times they attend church. And yet there's no, there's no change of heart. There's no salvation taking place. There's no way we can be able to expect change coming from the life of that individual or that person. Amen? You see? And you can see here as God's people that uh, the, the problem is that the religious leaders practice certain rituals to, sh to show their righteousness. But they never, they never uh, um, experienced or they never displayed the or ex exhibited the spirit of the law, which involves extending the Father's love and goodness to others. You know, you can, we can be so, we can be so um, um, heavenly minded and be not earthly good. Have you heard that before? When we can, we can, we can know the Bible um, in and out, and even what's in between, and yet um, it, we are so deficient in being able to extend the love of the Father and even the goodness of the Father to others, because all it is about us um, has something to do about the theory and what we hear and what we know about the Word of God, but there is no application of what we have learned before our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the same is true with us. If we pursue our own dreams of grandeur instead of obeying God, okay, we are scheduled or there is a danger for us to fail and to be disappointed. My beloved, there will be times when we will mistakenly think that we could not possibly be guilty of you know, re recognition. Now, I want to tell you, you know, because that is in our nature. It is not only those people who are rich. It is not only those people who are wealthy, those in high position, those of uh, authority, and those who are powerful, the ones that are always seeking recognition, just like what the Lord Jesus Christ pointed out in Matthew chapter 23. But the same folly also falls to the people who are low like us. You don't necessarily have to have power. You don't necessarily need to have all these things in order for you to not qualify into falling just like those in the high places. In fact, the poorest person can also be guilty of this mindset because it is a belief based not on possessions but on overinflated sense of self or of our ego. My beloved, we, can, we, we do have an ego that that will get going every now and then. And if we will not, you know, if we will not take the time to, to tame and to restrain and to do these things um, to our ego, then um, we are uh, doomed uh, for failure. Or there's a, 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 an appointed time for us to be able uh, to fall, just like what the, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. So my beloved, this deadly attitude of the heart and mind is focused on dominance, recognition, and self-importance. You know, um, not very long ago, you know, we were taking counseling uh, classes with Pastor Hernes, and uh, that is actually one of the, uh, the things that, that we can be able to find in the, in the life of a person, how every person... Um, uh, not only has an emotional cup that needs to be filled every now and then, but at the same time, there's also that other side of us um, where we always constantly seeking uh, self-gratification, satisfaction, and even recognition. But you can see here, you know, what, what dominates that attitude in us is the fact that, you know, um, we, 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 we think and we continue to believe that we are entitled to self-importance, which will keep us from being power, powerfully used by God. You know, brethren, the reason why I'm sharing this with you, brethren, is that uh, in light with you know, what is going on uh, in our ministry, in light with the message that we have heard this morning, in light with what is going on with certain people, we need to remember that and we need to be warned by what, what, by, by what is going on around us and that we need to take um, considerably uh, serious the, uh, the, the, the warning that we are receiving from the Word of God concerning 
uh, the danger of seeking recognition and con con um, and also um, uh, considering the uh, the danger of seeking um, self entitlement. Okay, because as I said to you earlier, uh, our self worth is not based on what I have done. It's not based on that. Your self worth, my self worth, is based on our relationship with Christ, and not only on our relationship with Christ. Because you can have everything in this world, right? But Mark chapter 8, verse 36 says, you know, you can have everything in this world, but what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and but yet lose his own soul? You can have all that. But there's also a danger that you can pretty much lose, you know, everything. That's why for this reason, it is very critical for us that we, we believers must examine our hearts. Amen? You know, every now and then, you know, we pray to the Lord. Lord, I, I, you know, we pray to God and, you know, we have our quiet time with the Lord and we serve Him. We come to Him for worship. But, you know, how many Christians, you know, you don't have to necessarily raise your hand. How many of us do really take the time to, to search, our, uh, search our hearts on a daily basis? You see? The Bible says in the book of 2 Corinthians, Chapter 13, verse 5. You know, we will not read the entire verse, but the Bible says, examine yourselves. Why? Why is there a great need for us to examine ourselves? You see, because my beloved, we are being uh, reminded, uh, ourselves are being reminded whether we have been infected by the sinful desire of, uh, uh, sinful desire for esteem or search for self-worth or value. You see, every now and then, you know, it's, 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 there's, there's nothing wrong every now and then for us to say, you know, is God using me? You know, but when, when we come to a point in our life when we begin to, to put that as more important than the opportunity that God can use us, then it becomes a problem. That's why, my beloved, Apostle Paul would have not said anything to the Corinthians if he did not see the importance of seeking our heart not only on a regular basis but when we are given the opportunity when he gave this challenge in 2nd Corinthians chapter 13 verse 5 he challenged the Corinthians examine yourself okay whether you are real Christians Apostle Paul said you see and my beloved every now and then for not only for those people who have chronic illness in our heart, those people who have heart disease, not only those people who have diabetes, but every single person here in this room, you know, we need, you know, regular uh, physical checkup. As much as we, there's a great need for us to have physical checkup, um, Paul is telling the Corinthians, telling the Christians tonight, we need to also have spiritual checkups. You see? It's spirit, it's spiritual checkups. For what purpose? Because as God's people, we need to have a growing awareness of Christ's presence in our lives, as well as His power in our lives. Amen? You know, in everything that, that, that is happening in our life, you know, one of the ways that we know that there is that awareness of God's presence in our life and also His power in our life is in the fact that, um, you know, we, we, we see... God working in whatever circumstances is taking place in our life. Whether it is something, whether there's a death in the family, um, uh, in death in the family, whether there's a loss of some sort, or whether there's uh, a trial of some sort, yet we know that God is working everything for good. Amen? We, we see that. As God's people, you know, we, when we search our heart, we only, not only search our heart, but we look for an awareness, growing awareness of Christ's presence and His power in our life. Especially, my beloved, we are not going to remain young forever. Amen? You know, we are still, we're all young in, in here. Amen? Amen? We're all young. <laughs> Amen? But as we near the end, as we near the end, as we near the end of this race, known as life, okay, I believe there's one thing that we we as God's people should, should 
be um, focusing on is how we take the, uh, the baby steps, not necessarily big strides to maturity, but baby steps yet consistent okay, to get closer to our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, you can have, you can have big strides every now and then, but what happens after you take a couple of strides, big strides? Then you take three big steps backward. Then you're still on a negative. But what is more important as God's people is we take those little baby steps. Okay? Yet consistent. Okay? As we, as we um, tread, you know, just like the song says, we're marching to Zion. We're marching right now. You know, it's, it is with, it's not yet within reach, but... We know it's going to come one of these days. But the Bible says, my beloved, you know, not only for us to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, but there must be a goal for every single person to take those baby steps so that you and I will, will come closer to him than ever before. Amen? All right. Now, as we near the end, the conclusion of this message tonight, I gave you the premise. Why? And what is the problem? Why it is uh, for us uh, seeking recognition is probably one of the pitfalls, pitfalls that we can find in the ministry. The pitfalls that we can be able to, to find uh, in our march towards uh, this, uh, li uh, this race known as life. But now let me, let me uh, share to you what are those four harmful effects when we seek prominence. Why it is not advisable for us to seek prominence. Now, brethren, um, we are in no hurry here. Amen? We are in no hurry here. We're not going anywhere. Okay? You know, as if the Lord comes tomorrow, then, you know, let it be. But it is what it is. Amen? But let me give you four, four things very briefly as far as what are the four harmful effects when we seek prominence. You know, when we seek prominence, not according to God's timetable, but according to ours. You know, when we begin to seek our own self-worth, our own value, when we begin to put ourselves in a pedestal, you know, more than anything else. Number one is that we must realize it's one of the harmful effects of seeking prominence that we must realize that when we seek prominence, it is something that is deceptive. You say, Pastor, can you explain that to me? How can seeking prominence be so um, um, deceptive, can be deceptive to somebody. Well, first of all, we, we need to have, uh, first of all, establish something here. It can be deceptive when we seek prominence, when we seek value and self-worth our, amongst ourselves. It is b mainly based on the belief that we can and should compare ourselves to others so we can so we can, uh, so we can, and should compare ourselves to others, so we can be found better than everyone else in some area. You see, brethren, I don't think it's advisable that we should be comparing ourselves um, to others, because this is absolutely false. This premise is absolutely false. You know, I want you to turn your Bible, please, to the book of Psalm 139. Okay, I want you. I want us to be able to see. Um, um, the working of God in our life and what His will is at the very moment. Okay? So when we seek prominence, value, and self-worth the wrong way, it's mainly based on the belief that we can and should compare ourselves to others so we can be found better than everyone else in some area. And this is absolutely false. In Psalm 139 verse 14, it says, I will praise thee, okay? for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. You know, looking at that verse, you know, what, what is the psalmist saying here? What the psalmist is saying here, God's people, is that God made every single one of us special. Amen? That's why the psalmist says, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God made every single one of us here special. You know, there is not going to be anyone else on earth 
like every single one of us. I mean, we know that there are two kinds, two kinds of twins. There are the identical twins, like Sister Shelley and Sister Liberty. And then there's also what we call the fraternal twins. If you remember those two visitors that Sister Linda Guzman had from the Philippines, uh, what's her name, uh, Brother John? Yes, they're, they're, you see one is male, one is female, and you know, they, they don't look exactly, there's some resemblance, okay? But what I'm trying to say here, God's people, is that each of us has a unique mix of talents. Each of us has a unique mix of gift. Each of us has a unique mix of traits. Like for instance, you know, uh, not very long ago we had uh, our musical and fundraising concert, you know, featuring the music of, you know, Pastor Hernes. And we know that he is a very talented man. You know, he's a very, you know, talented, you know, poet. You know, and then we, we saw also the, the talent of, you know, Mrs. Salonga, you know, by being a big part of that, that preparation. But don't, don't envy Pastor Hernes. Don't envy Mrs. Salonga. Because for the mix of talent, and trait and, and gifts that they have been entrusted, there is also responsibility. You follow me? You see, and, and, and God has made every single one of us special. Maybe for those of you, you know, you said, well, Pastor, I didn't know I have this talent. Well, because you have not really explored long enough. You said, well, Pastor, you know, I, I have this talent, but, you know, uh, it is a, a, an identified flying note. You know, if you have that talent of the identified flying note, might as well just keep it. <laughs> I'm just talking with you. But, you know, with a little practice, you know, get enrolled in the hymn academy, you know, you have a, you, there's hope in every one of you. There's hope in every one of us. Amen? You see? That's why, you know, there's for every talent, mix of talents and, and gifts, there's responsibility that comes with it. You know, God does not expect us to, to hide them under a bushel. You know, that's why there is the place in the Bible known as the parable of the talents. You are to use them. You are to invest them. You know, the fact that Sister Excella is playing the piano here every Sunday, every Wednesday, whenever she has the opportunity, training these men, young men and women, she is... Investing that talent. She is use, making use of that talent God, God had given to her. And you know, you just don't know it. You know, I can tell you right now, you know, Brother Jeremy has a talent in singing. Amen? Amen? That's why, you know, if, if, he, if he, he has a talent that he should sing more. Yeah. Right? You know, if you, know, if you uh, mass, mass can show on. Amen? <laughs> See? I say. <laughs> But anyway, you see, I want you to turn your Bible to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, okay? Just, just for you to see that, um, that God has a purpose in, in all of us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 to 11, I want you to see here that for every single person who is saved, who is baptized and under the umbrella of a New Testament in a Bible-believing church, there, God has a purpose in you. You know, you have a place in God's church. First Corinthians chapter 12, uh, beginning at verse uh, 4. It says, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. You see? And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God, which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Notice that, you see that? The manifestation, there is an opportunity, there is uh, a place. And then it says in verse 8, For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge, by the same Spirit, to another faith, by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing, by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another the prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, but all these work it that one and the self same spirit, dividing to every man se severally as he will. Verse 12, for as the body is one and hath many members, take note, 
and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. So you see, it's, it's like an orchestra, you see, playing different instruments, but all serving a common goal, a common purpose, to be able to play in accordance, okay? What, that one tune, to be able to glorify, to be able to please the listener, okay? The master, the one who composed the music. And that's the same thing. That is the design God has within the New Testament church is for us to use the talent. My beloved, nothing can cut those hedges, those shrubs in our church better than Brother Antonio. That's his talent. Amen? But that is a talent. It, it complements the ministry of the International Bible Baptist Church. He may, Brother Antonio may say, well, Pastor, I cannot preach. Pastor, I cannot, you know, he can sing. I cannot play the piano, but he can trim those bushes. Amen? And that's a blessing. Amen? You know, made our, made our facility really presentable today. You know, and praise God for, for our dear brother here. He said, Brethren, take note, God didn't make us superior or inferior. He created us to be unique and to fulfill his specific purpose for our lives. And when we measure ourselves against others, we're like comparing apples to oranges. That's not going to happen. You see, it's not a perfect world. You're not going to be able to have identical results. Two people are different. Some people are, are handsome. Some people are not so handsome. You know, some people are beautiful. Some people are not so beautiful. Okay? But we are judging ourselves by the standard that it's not God's will for us. Number two, another harmful effect when we seek God's pro when we seek prominence is when we seek prominence, it also encourages artificial divisions within the church, within the home, and the community. So when we seek prominence and also self-worth, our own self-worth in our own time, it also encourages artificial divisions within the church, the family, and the community. You know, brethren, anytime that we look down at somebody, anytime we give somebody a condescending approach, every time we look down at somebody, there is a big problem, especially in the family of God. You know, God does not want us to look down on anybody. Amen? You believe that? Because the attitude of superiority directly contradicts the command of Apostle Paul. I want you to turn to um, Romans chapter 12, verse 3. I want you to see over there how um, we should change our attitude of um, thinking more highly of ourselves than others. You see, brethren, you know that as we have heard many times in this pulpit, we are all the same in the eyes of God. Amen? We're all the same. In, 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 in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, the Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Amen? But to think soberly, according as God had dealt to every man the measure of of faith. See, we are, we are not to think highly of ourselves. You know, that means we are not to look down on anybody. Okay? But again, we have to again go back to the premise that we established earlier that our self-worth is in Christ. Our sufficiency is also in Christ. Amen? You see? And in other words, we are to find our worth in the Lord. Always remember that. You know, Richard Bryan, you may not have the success like the, the, the founder and CEO of Facebook. But your self-worth tonight hinges not on what you have in your wallet. But your self-worth tonight hinges in your worth before Christ and your personal relationship with Him. Amen? And the, the Bible very clearly says in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, If you are saved tonight, God had made us sit in heavenly places. Higher. Much better footing than any monarch. 
any king, any magistrate, any politician, any, anyone. But that is a guarantee. That's a given. That's something that God gave to every single one of us tonight. That's why, you know, don't look down. Don't, don't walk, on, walk on the street with your head down. Put your face up. Not because of pr pride, but because of arrogance, but because your self-worth, our self-worth is in Christ. Amen? Our self-worth is in Him. You see? Always remember that our self-worth is not found in our job, not found in our position, not found in our educational attainment. Although those things are important, they are not found on our savings account or on how people see us. But your self-worth is in Christ and also our relationship with Him. Thirdly, seeking for prominence is a deterrent that hinders us from being used of God fully. You know, brethren, we have no business telling the Lord what we will and what we will not do when He asks us to obey. You know, when God tells us, I want you to do this, there is no ifs and buts, but we just obey. Amen? You know, just like in, you know, in the military, you know, they said, you know, obey first, then, you know, question later. But in, in, the, in the economy of God, you know, um, you obey. You, you, we are not in a, we're not in a position to bargain with God. You know, because there's nothing that ever surprises God. Then we should just trust Him for what come our way. My beloved, you know, we don't have the time to go through all this, but uh, just, to, just to support the point uh, tonight where it says seeking for prominence is a deterrent that hinders us from being used fully by God. The supporting verse that I want to use on that is found in Genesis 37, verses 5 to 10. Uh, considering, of course, the life of Joseph. You know, the Bible tells us in, the, in that chapter that God promised Joseph great things, okay, in his dreams, right? Uh, Joseph even told those, those dreams, his dream to, to his uh, brothers. That's the very reason why he was sold to the Sabaeans and why he ended up in that pit. Because about the story about those, those stars and all these things. But imagine, my beloved, if Joseph had refused to honor the Lord while he was in prison in all those years. You know, probably, you know, if we, have, we didn't have the patience that, that Joseph had, we probably said, why, why do I have to go to jail? I didn't do anything. You see? All those times that he was, you know, he went to jail and he refused to honor the Lord while he was there because he thought the assignment was beneath him or he thought the assignment was, was uh, not worth it. Then my beloved, I believe it's fair for us to say tonight that if, if Joseph would have refused to believe the leading in the hand of God, then Joseph would have missed God's best for his life. You know, sometimes when we refuse to obey, without a doubt, we will refuse God's best for our life. You see? And we can see here what was God's best in the life of Joseph. He went to jail. That was in Genesis chapter 37. But what happened? Two chapters later, Genesis chapter 39 and Genesis chapter 41. 39 to 41. We find there that Joseph was given the position to be second in command in hold the land of Egypt. Why? Because he obeyed God. You see? He did not think high of himself. Okay? And as God's people, we must be willing to do whatever God calls us to, no matter what. Now, brethren, go to James chapter 4, verse 6, please. And one more point and we're done. You know, just give me about three more minutes. We'll be done. James chapter 4, verse 6. And I want you to circle your Bible, okay? When you go to James chapter 4, verse 6. We know that all the verses in the Bible are important, but... This is probably one of the many things where, many verses that we read, but we don't really allow it to sit in um, as we read it. But in James chapter, chapter 4, verse 6, okay, it says, 
but he giveth more grace. It says here, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud. Okay, but what? He giveth more grace unto the humble. Okay, but giveth grace unto the humble. So you can see here, when when the Bible says give it grace, it is actually translated to the Greek word, okay, my sona, which means more grace. So it's actually useless. It's actually useless and futile for us to be able to elevate ourselves. Hey, this is who I am. Okay? You need to follow me because this is who I am. This is what I have done. No. But the Bible says, let, let God do the building. Let God do the lifting up. Let God do the promotion. Okay? As opposed to we ourselves doing it. But the Bible says, God give it more grace. Okay? More grace. That, the grace that is translated here brings us to another level of grace. That is what Masona is. Okay? So you can see here, my beloved Christians, you know, there's, there's no use to, for us, you know, wasting time trying to battle ourselves more and more, you know, doing this and doing that. But when God's instruction for us is just to, to submit to Him. And finally, last point, when we seek prominence, okay, it can bring extremely disappointing situation in our lives. You see, sometimes, you know, we may expect, like trying to expect for uh, uh, a train that, that is going to come in 10 minutes when in actuality you were late, you didn't see it come ahead of you already. You see, when we build our self-worth on an image that we must constantly protect and polish, then we will ultimately find out emptiness and disenchantment. You see, we must, never, we must never succumb to a point in our life when we must always protect our reputation. We must protect something this. Because, my beloved, if, if we are really children of God, you see, it will, it will be naturally, uh, consi considerably naturally, that will happen is that we were going to walk accordingly to the will of God in our lives. So eventually, whatever uh, made us uh, will stand out and fade. You know, whether it is beauty, whether it's intelligence, whether it's wealth, whether it's talent, creativity, whatever it is based on, it is here today, but it will be gone tomorrow. Talent, whatever we base it on, will fade. It will, and they will disappear. Now the question is, then what will we do the very moment that they disappear? What will we do? the very moment that they are no longer um, within our reach. The answer is nothing because our time has passed. That opportunity has already gone before us. So tonight, that is what status amounts to, a handful of air. But there's going to be a time when it is going to be completely inexistent. Right, brethren, let me remind you tonight, we don't really possess anything real. And the worst part is we spend so much time trying to compete with and outdo others that we will never experience the joy that comes from being united within the body of Christ and fulfilling God's purpose. Brethren, let us not try to outdo one another. But let us remember, we are all on the same side. We're all on the winning team. Amen? You know, the, what the fact of the matter is we, every now and then we miss the point that we really, we really have a, a, an enemy and he exists. And it is not each other that we should be quarreling or fighting against. But we have a real enemy. Okay? That continues to, to befall us, that continues to discourage us, continues to make us ineffective. And he, it is to whom we should uh, uh, really focus our attention to uh, this evening. So, while every head be bowed and every eyes be closed, no one looking, I want you to please stand with me as we go to our invitation. Okay? While every head be bowed and every eyes be closed, I shared with you tonight the fitfalls of the ministry and the Lord's work. 
from time to time this, this Christian life that well, we have been assigned to, uh, to travel has become more very difficult to navigate because of many issues taking place in our life. But I want to remind you tonight, God's people, that um, when we begin to spend so much time trying to compete and insist our own ways, and as opposed to trying to think what is best for everybody, um, and being united within the body of Christ in fulfilling God's purpose, that is really the time when we will experience the joy that we're looking for. God's people, we can miss the path that, would, that could bring this true significance because we fail to walk in the center of God's will. The center of God's will is the very best place where we can be tonight. And as the Lord Jesus Christ is saying to us, let us avoid being infected by the attitude of seeking prominence because he wants us to experience life at its best. Okay. Let us wait for God's time in our life. Okay. Not according to our own desires. And again, the title of our message tonight, as I shared with you this evening, is for us as God's people, for us to be coming first, we need to be last. It speaks of humility. If there's anything that you want to confess before God tonight, I want you to please come to the altar. As the Bible says in Matthew chapter 23, verses 11 and 12, And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. My beloved, there cannot be any better promise than that. We must start by viewing ourselves tonight and those around us from God's perspective. Tonight, we are sinners saved by grace at the level ground of the cross. No, none of us ever earned his way to heaven. You know, none of us here is better than anyone else. So if there's one thing that God is asking us tonight is to remain and to continue to humble ourselves before Him. As the Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 10, humble yourself before the mighty hand of God and He shall lift you up. Let's ask God to search our heart and reveal areas of sin and pride then agree that we have fallen out of His standard and allow God to continue working in our life. Brethren, we cannot turn another cheek away from this warning that God has given us tonight and how we should stay away from the pitfalls of the Lord's work and the ministry. Let's pray. Gracious and loving Father, Lord, tonight, Lord, thank you, Lord, for reminding us, Lord, tonight that in order, Lord, for us to be first, there is, Father, Lord, an opportunity in which, Lord, we are presented that we need to also come last. And, Lord, that entails a great need, Lord, in our life for sacrifice and also for humility and room, Father, Lord, for, uh, for others that we may, Father, Lord, constantly seek to glorify you, O oh Lord, in our lives and also to draw others to faith in Christ. Father, Lord, tonight we ask that you um, continue to work in our lives, Lord, as your servant. Help us, Father, Lord, that we will continue to follow the example that you have shown us, Lord, in the cross and how you humbled your, yourself, O oh God. And Lord, thank you, Lord, this evening that you have allowed us, Father, Lord, to meet in spite, Lord, of us being few in numbers, O oh God. Once again, Lord, we just want to give you all the praise and the glory. For in Jesus' name, Lord, this is our prayer. Amen.
You're dismissed. God bless you.